Welcome to the Higher Ed Athletics Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Chris Clooney, the Director of Athletics at Davidson College. Chris, thanks for being on the podcast. Thanks for having me, Travis. Well, you know, we, uh, you're quite active on Twitter, and we, we both started following one another around the same time. I was on my you know, hashtag HEA road trip in May, where I, I visited uh, 17 schools in four days um, on my way to visit my, uh, my best friend in uh, Wilmington, North Carolina. And, or, and, you know, there's just so many schools in, Char- or in the Charlotte area and North Carolina area. Um, that my roadmap didn't let me stop at every single one. But I was hoping that maybe you could give the audience just maybe a profile, uh, institutional profile and athletic department profile of um, of Davidson College. And I'm thinking, you know, uh, the size, location, athletic conference, number of sports, those types of things. Sure, absolutely. So Davidson College is a small liberal arts institution, private institution. I call it a small school with big school opportunities. We have roughly 2,000 undergraduate students. We do not have a graduate school. Um, so all of the, it's a four-year institution. Um, from an athletic perspective, we compete in the Atlantic 10 Conference. Um, we have 21 sports at Davidson. 19 of those sports compete in the Atlantic 10 Conference. The only two that do not are football, which plays in the Pioneer Football League, and wrestling, which is in the Southern Conference, right? So um, 21 sports, 11 men's teams, 10 women's teams. Um, and yeah, so it's, it's, uh, d- obviously a division one, uh, institution and, um, it's a great place. You know, if you, you know, unfortunately you weren't able to visit last time, but definitely hopefully you have the opportunity to do so soon. Yeah, I, I'll be doing another trip, um, out there, uh, for a wedding next, next spring. So Davidson's right up there on the schools. I got to stop at and in UNC Charlotte and a couple other in the area. It's just, the state's just full of beautiful colleges and, uh, you know, that doing my research on Davidson, it really reminded me a lot of um, a couple other small liberal arts division one institutions uh, that I've had. Obviously, every college is different, but um, I've had um, uh, UNC Asheville and Colgate athletic directors on. And and uh, there's just something I, I come from. I, I grew up sandwiched between two D3 institutions out in uh, western west of Indianapolis and then uh I worked for years at, at a D2 uh, small liberal arts university. And so it's just something about those universities are great. And I think it's awesome whenever we have those uh, that fit in the D1 landscape too, because it is non-traditional. Um, uh, you all are, it's like 25% or something of, of students are actually college athletes. They're scholar athletes, as I think you all call them at Davidson. So just an awesome place. And, and you were also a former scholar athlete at Davidson College on the basketball team. So I'm always curious, I've interviewed several ADs. Uh, there's not a lot of them out there that actually were student athletes at the, uh, at the school they're leading, but I've been able to talk to a, a couple. And you know, when that position opened, you know, first, what is your initial thought about making your interest known? Because you weren't in the college athletics space at that point, I don't think. And then if you don't mind, maybe walk us through that process of how do you prepare for an interview at a place that you already know so well but be able to also instill your own vision on the interview process. Sure. Uh, so when the job opportunity became available, I wasn't interested flat out. I was working for the MBA. I actually recommended somebody else for the job, believe it or not. <laughs> There's a good friend of mine is a senior associate AD at a, at a power five school at the time. Um, and I, I called him up and said, Hey, Davidson, the AD job is open. This is it. This is a great opportunity. He called me back like a day or two later. And I said, hey, you're going to apply. He said, no, I'm not, but I really think you should. And and let me back up by saying, when the position opened up, Davidson hired a search firm. And that search firm reached out to me, not as a candidate, but as somebody who could potentially provide provide insight as to what they should be looking for in the next AD, right? So I assume that uh, the president put together a list of, hey, here's some, some, I hesitate to say the word prominent, but here's some, some alums uh, you know, working in sports or former scholar athletes and, 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 you know, that you could reach out to to provide some insight. So I was on that list and actually spoke to the search firm, again, not as a candidate, but as sort of a reference, right? And say, hey, your next AD should be this, this, that, whatever. Then I recommend my friend and say, hey, you should apply. And he says, no, I'm not going to apply. You really should. And it took me having a 45 minute conversation with him to help me realize, uh, again, it's such a unique opportunity being an alum, being a former scholar athlete to serve as, as the AD at your alma mater and how the MBA and my skill set there could translate into being an AD. 
And then I started to realize, holy crap, like this could be an opportunity. So that's, that's kind of how it happened. I wasn't interested and it took me having a conversation and to think a little bit outside of out the box, right? I'd been sort of so narrow-minded, wasn't really thinking about this. I was thinking, hey, I want to be a GM, I want to stick with the NBA, but there's an opportunity here and, and I have to sort of view it through a different lens, if you will, different perspective. And that's what sort of put me on that path. Um, the interview process is interesting, right? So I, I think you said it, you said it best. It's, you know, I know this, I knew the school so well, but I think what I told folks is I knew Davidson, I didn't know the job, right? So I knew Davidson, I knew the people, I knew the community. There were people that were still here, are still here when I was a scholar athlete, but I didn't know the job, right? I knew a little bit about what being an AD was about. And so for the interview process, I really focused on, um, on honing in on what I knew about Davidson and, and how that sort of impacted me and my core beliefs and values, but really focusing on what the job entailed such that I was able to draw specific lines to what I had done at the NBA, what I had done previously um, in my other experiences and how that would have a positive or could have a positive impact on the, on, on the role is of, of director of athletics. And so um, I did a lot of research. I did a lot of research on the school. I talked to a lot of folks. Um, luckily I had some friends in the industry. I leaned on them heavily and, and really sort of tried to craft a mission and a vision for, hey, if I was able to, if I had the opportunity to get this, this job, here's what I would see. And also ask a lot of questions um, of, of what they're looking for. So it definitely was a, a unique process to say the least. Well, you, you talked about how uh, you were at the NBA and you wanted to be a GM and that you had some transfer of skills. What skills uh, or what was your kind of role in your career in the NBA? I think you were there for a decade or so. And then what what were those skills that you think uh, transfer over now being in the job for a couple of years that you look back on, you know, you know that really prepared me in the NBA to, to lead an athletic department? Sure. So I, I, I ran international basketball operations for the NBA. So I, I oversaw all of our international development programming, right? So one of the major programs, um, actually, you won't be able to see it on the podcast, but if you look behind me, you can see a jersey there that says, you know, Basketball Without Borders, Africa, right? So I ran the Basketball Without Borders program that did camps in Africa, Asia, Latin America, and Europe. You bring in the top 16, 17 year old prospects from that region. You bring over NBA players and coaches, and it's a four-day camp that exposes them to NBA-style teaching and instruction. So I actually worked with a ton of quote-unquote scholar athletes, right? Thousands of scholar athletes over that over those ten years, um, in in exposing them to to NBA, um, to, to to exposing them to to high-level coaching, and a lot of those kids ended up coming to high school and to college to come and play come and play basketball, and so. Um, that was one of the main programs that I oversaw. We really ran the development of the international game. We tried to build the basketball to complement the business of basketball for the NBA, right? So that was my main focus. The last three years, in addition to that, I ran the NBA draft combine. And that was probably the closest I came to higher ed intercollegiate athletics. Because when you're running the combine, you're now working with, um, you know, college athletes, you know, uh, men's basketball players, you're, you're working um, with institutions and, and, and head coaches, you're working with agents. And so um, running the combine from A to Z, right? Picking the players, running the sports performance, running the team interviews, running the, the medical side, um, that really exposed me on, on, on many levels to intercollegiate athletics and, and, and men's basketball. Um, and I also ran NBA All-Star Basketball Operations. So everything from, you know, selecting the dunk contest participants and three-point contest participants to running all of the um, logistics and hotels and transportation for all-star participants and their families. And, and so, you know, large-scale events, um, really impactful events, international opportunities. So for me, you know, those, the, that, that 10 years with the NBA, you look at a few different things. I knew how to work with a lot of different constituencies, right? So, you know, athletes, scholar athletes, right? Um, young 16 to 17 year old uh, men and women that are playing basketball, you have that sort of scholar athlete exposure. I worked with a ton of coaches, right? A ton of NBA coaches um, and a lot of NBA team personnel. And so I've worked with administrators. I've worked with GMs and assistant GMs. I've worked with head athletic trainers and uh, head strength coaches. And I've worked with um, assistant coaches and head coaches, right? So you had a lot of um, uh, uh, coaching development and administrative development from that perspective. Traveling a ton, you know, we work with um, basketball federations, governmental entities, like just a number of different um, folks across 
um, you know, across the globe that worked in different areas, whether it's government, nonprofit, et cetera. And so you sort of equate that to, look, you're working with a ton of different stakeholders. It's no different than what you're doing here as an AD, right? You're working with parents, you're working with alums, you're working with um, uh, businesses, you're working with corporations and corporate sponsors, you're working with um, coaches, administrators, scholar athletes. And so that exposure to dealing with so many different constituencies, working at a high level of stress and, and, and pressure, right? You're working on large scale events and programming. It's no different than, you know, run, trying to run and build programs, right? And you're trying to build winning programs on and off the court, on and off the field, et cetera. So there were just a lot of, of lines that were drawn to connect what I had done, you know, over a decade of, of, of experience with the NBA on the international and domestic side to, to, to running an athletic program at, again, a, a top uh, division one program. Yeah, I think um, so in my role in college athletics, I've always been in compliance and academics with all coaches. And so um, whenever you're talking about that and how you do, deal with a lot of coaches and different administrators, that what what my mind went to was you're dealing with a lot of different personalities um, and rightfully so people that think or understand that their program is the most important program that, and you have to be able to make them feel like the most important person in the room at the time, probably. And so uh, I'm guessing the the personality thing probably helped out a lot whenever you're now you're overseeing and responsible for so many coaches too. Yeah, absolutely. It's, and it's, and it's less about, Hey, you're the most important person in the room because look, there, there are times where you're not going to be, there are going to be different priorities, right? I think it's shared ownership. You want people to feel like they have a sense of ownership and a stake in what we're doing and what we're building. And there's also a sense of psychological safety such that they can speak their mind. Um, they, they go about their business. There's a level of trust without re fear of repercussion, right? As long as we're transparent, we're open and honest, there's a level of integrity to how our relationships are developed. You know, that's what I want our coaches and administrators to feel. That's what I want our scholar athletes to feel. And so there's a shared ownership. You have a stake in what we're doing. That means that no matter what, you're a team player, you want to see us and see everyone succeed. Seeing other people succeed means we all succeed. And that's what we're trying to build here. A lot of your experience there is also um, your experience traveling abroad, working with, uh, with, you know, athletes from different countries and, you know, a missing component of all this uh, name, image, and likeness talk NIL is the ability for inter international college athletes to profit off their likeness here in America um, due to, you know, visa um, laws and, and those things. I'm curious what your initial concerns about this uh, lack of guidance that's been out there. Um, it's, it seems like an issue that's not easy to solve, but also um, if you given any, you know, consideration to what either state or federal government, higher education or the NCAA in general, what can we do to either educate or, you know, try and fix this for college athletes so that they too can have these same rights that are new for college athletes. It's an ever shifting, ever evolving landscape. And the biggest thing I would say is to educate yourself. Know exactly what is permissible, what's not permissible. Understand what the, the NCAA policy is. Understand what state and local policies are. And if you have your own institutional policy, know that you know, front to back, right? And so to be able to educate scholar athletes, this really isn't about finding and creating opportunities for them. It really is about educating them on how to go about those opportunities and do it the right way. Right. And so that's one of the biggest things. Unfortunately, there's 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 not coordination. It's disjointed. There are some states that have legislation. There are some that don't. There's not comprehensive federal legislation. That was a big miss by the NCAA. And and, and I get that I'm the NCAA. Right. Like we're the NCAA. We're a member institution. But it, it was definitely a big miss not having a comprehensive uh, you know, structure or framework in place, not having the backing of Congress from for federal legislation that would blanket the entire country and, and all institutions. We're hopefully going to get there eventually, but until then, it's just sort of happening on a, on a disparate level, right? It's just sort of other states and, and other institutions are looking different depending on where you are. It is what it is. And so with that, you take the, the hand that you're dealt. You know, we have our policy. We created a policy. We feel good about it. It's, it's four pages long. It's very succinct. It's to the point. It provides clear definitions and outlines uh, the, the way to go about uh, the, the NIL activity, um, what you have to disclose, what's permissible, what's not, also leaves the room open for um, as the landscape shifts and evolves down the road and we start to learn more and um, things are adjusted. And such that our biggest goal is just to provide education, provide tools and resources to educate scholar athletes, because the last thing we want is for their 
eligibility to be jeopardized, but we are 100% supportive of them using their name, their image, and their likeness to be compensated, right? It's just a new world that we're in. Do you think that, um, and it's rightfully so that institutions, all they can really do is educate. Like we can't, you know, help uh, secure deals or anything like that. From an international perspective, and I don't know how many international students are at Davidson, um, but just given your background and your knowledge of, of international as well, do you think that the inability to, to act on their behalf and the hesitancy uh, at the uh, college athletics level is going to hurt our chances of being able to help international athletes come up with a policy for them? Or is that just, is it just, uh, you know, you're out of luck until we can figure out the visa laws or what's kind of like, I'm just thinking of international student athletes is pretty big on Twitter right now about how it's not fair for them, but at the same time, it's not really the role of athletic departments to get involved in that. But, um, you know, obviously international offices on college campuses can have a little bit of sway to talk to the correct people and, in Congress, but this isn't something the NCAA or you know Davidson College can change, right? This has to be has to be done at a at a federal level. I'm guessing. Um, uh, what can we do for international athletes? Is there anything we can do? Yeah, you you can advocate for clarity, right? Essentially, that's what we're just waiting on and and and, and hoping for is, is clarity, right? Like they can't engage in you know quote unquote normal NIL activity because it could jeopardize their F1 visa status, right? Like. Right now, international scholar athletes are only be able, they're only able to be paid by uh, uh, the institution, right? They can get a job working at the institution. Now, we have a number of scholar athletes that are, that are doing that. And so this, this name, image, likeness opportunity shifts that potentially, right? And so is it permissible for an international scholar athlete to be from say Australia, to be in their home country, to go into an arrangement with an Australian based company and firm, right? We don't know. and. We need clarity on that to be able to provide guidance to say that yes, you can or no, you can or here's what's allowable, et cetera. So it, the biggest thing that we can do is really advocate. You're right. Like we we don't make the rules, we don't govern, uh, we don't provide you know governance over over um, federal laws around around immigration, et cetera, status, et cetera. So it, it really is to advocate for our scholar athletes. Hey, we need clarity. We want to provide guidance. The, the landscape is shifting. You've got to shift it as quickly as the landscape shifts. And hopefully there's a little bit more clarity and transparency sooner rather than later. Well, I want to stick uh, with one more little question about NIL because you had mentioned that your institution, you know, created a four page policy and yeah, I haven't worked at, sm at a smaller institution before and, and, you know, as, as large as I've worked at small liberal arts, I've worked at um, what we, you would call a mid major in college athletics, a public regional, and then now at a power five uh, public research university. I'm curious at, at your institution, who's in the room or who's involved in the process of drafting that um, and the considerations that are given from people all over campus? Sure, so it's, it's, it's definitely a team effort. First off, you, you're talking to your colleagues, you're talking to your peers. I talk to other ADs, right? And other ADs talk to me. And honestly, our policy is a sort of um, mashup of, of policy from other institutions, right? Other A10 institutions and other Power Five institutions, et cetera. We're not trying to recreate the wheel. We're all in this together, right? And so we took a lot of direction and asked a lot of questions. But there are a number of people that need to be engaged in, in the process, right? Like your, your head of compliance, obviously, our senior athletic staff, which includes our head of compliance and our other senior administrators. Um, you need to have your head of marketing in, engaged because they oversee licensing and how does that licensing relationship interact with the ability to not use or use marks, institutional marks? You need the general counsel for the institution engaged so that they're aware and understanding of um, you know, specific policies in place. You need the head of marketing communications for the institution, right? Because they're going to start seeing athletes being signed up as Barstool athletes and how does that impact sort of the, 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 the perspective and, and how Davidson is being viewed. Uh, you need in, you need input from scholar athletes, right? So we engaged SAC, the Student Athlete Advisory Council. Uh, we kept our our uh, faculty athletic representatives abreast of of, of what's going on and and uh, be able to provide input. And so there's just a number of of constituency stakeholders across the institution that it makes sense to have them engaged. Um, you're sharing it with coaches, obviously, and other administrators for feedback to give them the opportunity. I just just did a Zoom this morning with head coaches and assistant coaches. They had a PowerPoint that our compliance director ran through just around NIL, around our policy, give them the opportunity to ask questions and so that they can educate their scholar athletes. So the more people that are engaged and the more people that are educated, the better because the umbrella is that much bigger and you're able to sort of fill in the gaps and make sure that, you know, scholar athletes are, are doing the right thing. 
I want to talk about a uh, shift to, you know, being part of the senior leadership team for President Quillen. And with, a, like I said earlier, a quarter of the student population being athletes, I'm, I'm sure it's critical for you to keep a pulse of the entire institution. I've seen you do this in ways on Twitter, but in what ways, and this, can, this is really for advice for people that are in a similar situation, regardless of the size of their institution, what ways do you try and intentionally stay involved with the inner workings of the overall institution and not just attending athletic events, but how are you staying involved with everything Davidson College? Yeah, well, it's an integral part of my job. I, I think I report to President Quillen, which is critically important. I serve on the senior leadership team, which is critically important, provides strategic guidance and, and a foundation for, for the institution, provides policy, provides procedures, et cetera. I think one of the biggest things that, that people realize, and you know this being in higher ed, people think that being at a small school, everybody talks to each other. And that's not the case. It's usually at smaller schools that they're actually more isolated and siloed, right? And so one of the biggest things that we're trying to do is not to be so siloed, not to be sort of um, so strict within our specific areas and not communicate across lines horizontally or as it may be, right? And so we want to be more of a cross-functional institution. And so that's why the senior leadership team is so important. That's why having athletics, not just separate from the institution, but as an integral part of the institution. I think President Quillen, you know, says it so eloquently, you know, athletics has educational value. Like there is educational value in athletics, right? And so those two are, are work hand in hand. Um, you know, our kids are scholar athletes, right? They're scholars first, they're students first, um, and they're here to get an incredible education. And athletics is, 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 is secondary to that, right? And so we're, we are part of the institution. Our coaches and administrators, the first thing they are is educators right? They're educators. That's, that's what they do. They mentor and then they coach. That's why we want great people first and great coaches second. And so, you know, I say all that to say it's critically important to, to have a pulse on the strategic uh, direction of the college, to have a pulse on other departments. And, and because we cross so many different boundaries, right? It's important for me to have a good relationship with the executive director of career development because we want our scholar athletes to have opportunities to set themselves up for internships and job opportunities and set themselves up for when they graduate. It's important for us to have a pulse with college relations and fundraising, right? Because athletics fundraising is a big part of that. Um, the alumni base, right? With scholar athletes, and parents and supporters, that's a big part of that. It's important for us to have a pulse and, 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 and good relationship with the Dean of Students Office, right? Because there's so much of an engagement. There's students first, right? So whether it's misconduct or different policies or residence life or student health, whatever it is, you're always integrated. It's important for us to have a good relationship with the dean of faculty and the head of academic affairs, right? Because we're missing classes, right? We have a missed class policy. No more than three Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or two Tuesday, Thursday. Um, there are, are different opportunities across, um, you know, athletics and academics that, that you're, you're able to take advantage of um, by having those, those, those uh, really strong relationships. And so it's critically important to, to be a part of the senior leadership team, to have a pulse and good relationships across different departments because athletics is fully integrated into the institution and the institutional mission um, of, of leadership service and having impact. Yeah, and it's, um, it almost seems that if, uh, if you're not intentional as the athletic department of being inviting to others and, and integrating with the rest of the institution and you're not showing that you want to do that, that there's sometimes this perception about athletics that if you don't, and you could, you could be the nicest people in the world, the nicest athletic department, but if you don't make it intentional that you want to be a part of the rest of the institution, you could probably create some, uh, some people on campus that uh, you feel like you're alienating them and, and keeping them uh, you know, separate and not in sync. And so it's always good when we see people intentional. What you talked about, it reminds me a lot of Charlie Cobb at Georgia, Georgia State when he was on the podcast of, of how he stays intentional with it and um, at their, uh, at Georgia State University. And so the intentionality there is clear and so that's great to hear. And, you know, one thing I'm thinking might help um, with your, with your role, I'm curious to learn about is also as uh, when you arrived at Davidson, you were filling the AD chair, your predecessor that had led the department for almost 25 years, Jim Murphy. And I'm guessing he was the AD whenever you were there. Cause I, I can tell you're not, you're not too old uh, removed uh, from your scholar athlete days. So he's now, he's still there and he's a senior advisor to the president and also on President Quill and her leadership team. So I'm curious what that transition was like because I was a part of an institution that had a similar situation. And 
what was that transition like if him being around do you lean on him for certain things it's someone on campus that can literally you can have discussions with about decisions you have to make that had has lived that at the same institution with a, what I'm guessing a school like yours probably doesn't have tons of coaching turnover in that amount of time that you've been there uh, so what's that relationship been like and how did it help with the transition yeah it was great it was great Jim actually retired in 2020 so he's he's uh, formally retired, no longer a senior advisor, no longer on the senior leadership team. But he was when I initially started, right? He transitioned from, from AD to that senior advisor role. And, and it was great. It was great. So I, I would say yes and no in terms of, of, of leaning on Jim, because there are certain things that it was just critically important to have conversations and just get context, right? Just have context into alumni relationships and why decisions were made about the budget or scholarships or just to have context and, and, and provide those that 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 nuanced conversation around you know the way that things were done. But also it was important to chart our own path, to sort of put a stake in the ground and say, hey, the, the, like our goal is to continue to do the things well that have always been done um, that make the most sense, right? And then we also want to do things differently um, if it's helping us become the best version of ourselves, right? Like if Davidson was the best version of itself, then we would just continue doing the things that were done in the past. And we would have just continued on right in that line. And that's not the case. And that's fine. Nobody's the best version of themselves. You can always get better. And so I think it was a combination of when things would come up, there were opportunities to lean on Jim, absolutely, to talk to Jim. And he'd been through the ringer 25 years. He'd seen it all, done it all. And he did, had a fantastic career and shepherded um, Davidson through numerous uh, just you know, significant pieces, whether it was the 1992 men's soccer final four, whether it was the shift in from the Southern Conference to the A-10, you know, a few years back, uh, numerous conference championships and a ton of academic accolades. Like Jim did a fantastic job. And so um, being able to lean on that, lean on that expertise, that experience and that, that context while simultaneously saying, look, this is how things were done and this is how we're gonna do things now because again, we're not where we want to be. We're not where uh, we're not sort of seeing ourselves as 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 reaching the the, the pinnacle of, of of achievement and, and and excellence. And that's what we want to do. That's that's what we're striving for. And so it was definitely a balance of of the two. And so I'm definitely thankful for for Jim for for being a resource in that respect and for laying the groundwork for us to to continue the good work that that he uh, contributed to. Yeah, it sounds like a, a great foundation that you can kind of chart your own path uh, as the department. It, you know, I read a quote, I think it was in your bio that said, um, I want to quote, I want to help build a strong team Davidson culture and move beyond being a national story and into a national program, end quote. Um, I think from an athletic standpoint, I was, the first thing that went to my mind, right, was, you know, we're 30 minutes into this, the first time mentioning that the name Steph Curry um, that is attributed to, to Davidson. But I'm wondering, is that part of that national story or was it more about the institution and, and the other successes? What did you mean by that, by that quote? Um, and also the follow-up question to that is, how do you actually do that? What's the roadmap to, to become a national program instead of just a national story? Yeah, I think it's a number of different things. Obviously, Stephen Curry and the incredible 2008 run to the Elite Eight was a part of that, right? Like that was an incredible national story. But you look at how mid-major programs that have had success, whether it's you know Gonzaga, whether it's Butler, being able to leverage those stories, those flashpoints, I call them, right? Like we've had a number of incredible flashpoints, right? Our men's baseball team made it to the Super Regionals uh, in uh, 2017, we had the 2008 run in, in men's basketball uh, back in 2008. Like we've had sort of last points of success, right? And so those are stories, right? Like those are stories that pop up and then they're sort of there and then you don't necessarily go back to them, right? So how do you move from being a story to a program? It's hard just being a story because Davidson, again, is unique, right? Like we've had flashpoints of success because we're lucky and we're good, right? Like it takes a little bit of luck, right? Cause there's some luck involved with the 2008 run, right? Like there's luck involved with these flashpoints of success. You're also good. You have good scholar athletes, you have good coaches, but it's really hard because you feel like you're always pulling a rabbit out of a hat, 
right? It's, it's, it's hard. You need a lot of things to go right, a lot of things to go well, in addition to being good. And so how are you able to lay the foundation such that you're less focused on it being a story and, and, and you're just consistently, sustainably uh, a successful program, right? Like, what does that look like? So you don't feel like you're pulling rabbits out of hats because you're always there. There's a championship competitive level, uh, you know, landscape to, to what you're trying to get to, right? And so how do you do that? Well, I think you, you, you invest, you need resources. You know, the story is all about doing more with less. Like we, we do so much with so little, why can't we do more with more, right? Like not more with the most, right? Like I didn't say more with the most, I said more with more, right? Like we've shifted from the a Southern Conference to the A-10, like we haven't necessarily shifted our mentality and our level of investment with that, right? In some areas we have, but in some we haven't, right? And so like, we need to invest more to do more with more because if we're having so much success with so little, how much more success will we have with that much more? It's also the chicken and the egg, right? Like, so some people think you need to invest in order to have success. Some people wait for the success in order to invest. We don't wanna wait for the success. We've seen that. Baseball had a successful run. They had investment on the back end. We want investment to come on the front end to build the sustainable framework, right? So that's, that's what we mean in terms of moving from just a national story and having flashpoint stories to being, national, being a national program. The biggest piece of this is confidence and humility. And I've talked about it a ton. We, need it, we don't balance confidence and humility as well enough as we should right? Like Davidson is a naturally humble institution, right? Like we're small, we're always David, we're never Goliath. Um, for us to win against power fives, like it's, it's a big deal, right? And so how do we move from that becoming sort of the exception and more of the norm, right? It's not always going to happen, but if we can put ourselves in a situation where we balance that humility with a level of confidence that, hey, this is where we belong, this is where we're supposed to be, such that now there's a championship competitiveness landscape um, where we're in the hunt every single year. It's not just a flashpoint. Hey, we're not going to win it every year, but we're in the hunt every year. We're in the top three every single year. We have given our shot, our, our chance, our kids a chance and an opportunity every single year. That's when you become a national program, right? That's what we're that's what we're building for. So it's it's a combination of 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 of, of investment. It's a combination of balancing confidence with humility, and and putting ourselves in the hunt at a championship competitive level every single year. Yeah, a lot of uh, what you're talking about, once again, reminds me to another er interview I had. I promise I'm not just plugging other episodes to link to this, but uh, Mike Roth from Gonzaga was on the podcast uh, right before the Final Four and talked to me about their their humble beginnings. And the investment part was uh, very critical that you also have to win before you invest too heavily. And, and you know, I, I, what made me think about it was the Steph Curry run was and it being a story was I worked at Indiana State and I grew up you know not about 45 minutes from Indiana State so when I say Indiana State who are you thinking about when I talk about athletics Larry Bird Larry Bird and everyone uh it's a story that they fight that you have to embrace it you know there's the statue but um one thing Sherard Clink Scales has done a great job um uh, at Indiana State is really trying to to invest and change things so that it is more just the not just the story. And um, that's one thing that I think that they've always been fighting there. And um, you know, a lot of it is the, the community too and trying to get them to buy into something new. And, you know, Larry Bird's a, a legend, and, but um, it, it is a, it's an interesting component. And so that was, that was some great conversation about, about what you're all doing at Davidson. And, and so it resonates. And I think that'll help some people that are, uh, have those flashpoints that you talked about. Um, Wrapping up here, you know, I this season I'm attempting to to really bring more futuristic and tactical advice to the podcast because the listeners are senior level administrators for the most part or higher education administrators. With that said, I've been asking people, what do you think the top one or two challenges facing D1 institutions in the next several years that maybe it can be something very obvious? It could be um, outside of NIL. Uh, or it could be something that is not even on the radar that is maybe something that is seen as smaller, but will eventually get to the tipping point. And also the follow-up will be, how do you think that'll affect D1 liberal arts institutions? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. There, there are a number of, you know, higher ed is definitely undergoing a little bit of a reckoning right now, just in terms of how expensive it is to attend some of these institutions, right? And so I think it'll be 
really interesting to see over the next few years, like how the, the, good, the good institutions will continually be able to sell the value proposition, right? Like this is, this is where we are. This is the type of institution we are. This is what we provide, right? So what's the, what's the outcome? What's the return? What's, everybody wants to know what the ROI is. What's the return on investment? What am I getting? And so the good institutions will have that and they'll be able to show it, document it, advocate for it. And that's what they're selling because here's the product. This is what you're going to get out of four years. Um, you're going to get an incredible education. You're going to get a, an incredible experience. It's going to put you on a pathway to be successful, right? So what's the return on investment? So I think that in and of itself is, is going to be interesting to see as a challenge moving forward. Our institution is going to be able to continue to, to adequately promote the return on investment for an education academic experience that's becoming increasingly, you know, just expensive, right? Like if there's no two ways about it, right? So that's, that's, and, and there are a number of liberal arts institutions in that mold, right? There are a number of liberal arts institutions that are, you know, private institutions that are on those, on that expensive range. Um, you know, Davidson's in the mix somewhat, but that, that's going to be critically important to, to, to continue to promote. I think athletics plays a big part in that. I think if you look at our, our quote unquote peers, all of our peers across the liberal arts landscape are really division two, division three, right? They're all the Swarthmore's, Haverford's, um, Bowdens and Amherst and nothing against those institutions, but they're all D3, right? And so what we bring, the level that we bring, um, the academic um, uh, excellence that we promote and that we provide along with division one athletics, it's definitely a, a, um, something that's distinct from that perspective. Um, so that's gonna be a challenge moving forward. I think again, the NIL, the name image likeness piece you mentioned, it's only gonna to lead to pay to play compensation conversations. And so that's something that's definitely important for the NCAA and member institutions to, to figure out, like you're already blending, you're starting to see the blending between sort of the academic and um, athletic or academic and, and sort of compensation, revenue generation, revenue generating world. Um, how, how much more blurred are those lines gonna become, right? Right now we're at um, being able to profit off name, image, likeness, but um, pay for play is, is people are pushing for it, right? So like, what, what, what is that gonna potentially look like? And so that's definitely another unique, unique challenge in the next few years that we're gonna have to face. Yeah, we went from cost of attendance to, uh, to NIL. And so the next natural flexing point will be uh, pay. And then I think that's where you're gonna start seeing institutions uh, have to put a stake in the ground on, you know, here's where we draw a line in the sand of what we are and are not going to do. And that's going to be probably a very interesting development. Um, you know, that what you said, the first part really made me curious uh, as a follow-up is about the difference between D1 and D3 and lots of the liberal arts are the D2 and D3 universities. And, you know, D3 does not obviously offer athletic scholarship. I'm wondering if, um, you know, like a Butler is in a similar situation like this, so Davidson being in the pioneer league for football that does not offer athletic scholarships, is that kind of, I wonder if that helps. Uh, it's almost like the best of both worlds. I mean, it's not good because obviously you'd like to give everyone a, a big scholarship, but with an institution like yours that 25% and then you're looking at hundred football players or more are paying uh, outside of whatever financial aid package they have outside of athletics. I mean, that is uh, probably a good, good situation for Davidson, but also for, to invest in the athletic department to make sure that that experience is a strong one because they're going to rely on that football team being able to attract a hundred people every year. And, and um, so I almost think that that might be the best of both worlds because you're not trying to come up always with that. How do we fill this dollar amount for the scholarships? You just have to provide a good return on investment for them to, to invest. Right. Absolutely. It's kind of a little hidden secret. Right, like non-scholarship football, people are starting to realize hmm, that model is actually a pretty great model, right? And and Davidson benefits, as do a number of pioneer football institutions. Um, you know, we benefit from financial aid. We have we have the Davidson Trust. We have great financial aid packages, and so even though we're not scholarship, we're able to attract people up and down the socioeconomic uh, um, landscape. Right. We're also able to attract more diverse scholar athletes, which is what we want, which which improves and makes our school, makes our, our environment better. Right. And so, um, you know, I think it's a great model for us. We've we've I'm, I'm glad we're non scholarship football. We obviously have a great coach and a great coaching staff who has embraced it and taken advantage of it. And we, we recruit against other FCS programs that are scholarship. We recruit against Ivy Leagues. Right. Like, again, what's your return on investment? Right. It goes back to what are you able to get out of this experience? And we're selling 
um, something that people are picking up because it's a great opportunity to come here for four years, play scholar, play uh, non-scholarship football, but at a high division one level, making the SES playoffs this year only helps. It doesn't hurt. Right. Um, and you're also getting a top notch education at a liberal, one of the best liberal arts schools in the, in the country. Right. And so uh, for us, we love the model. It, it works well for us. And we're going to continue to double down on it. Um, and like you said, continue to invest resources such that the scholar athlete experience is the best that it possibly can be. Well, my last question, Chris, is uh, another area I want to focus more on my interviews is talking about the education received by my guests, uh, you know, post uh, post bachelors. And, you know, we talked about Davidson the whole time, but it's also just kind of ending on what your experience as a master's student at Columbia University was. And what did you study and how do you think that shaped yourself as a leader of a college athletic department? Is there anything that you pull from that that obviously probably helped you in the MBA as well, but that you kind of lean into um, your graduate program? Yeah, I, you know, I was at Columbia and in, in a Columbia SEPA program, um, was able to, 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 to get a master's in um, uh, public affairs and focus on advanced finance and management. It was a great experience. I, I wasn't sure if I wanted to go back. And um, I, I'm fortunate enough I was able to do so. And I'm glad I did I actually ended up, you know, help me for, you know, with this opportunity, right? Um, having that, you know, secondary degree. And so um, it was a great experience. I was, you know, 2012, so six years removed from undergrad at that time. I was still working for the MBA. I did it part-time in, in uh, um, uh, the, the part-time program. And so to be able to be exposed to um, undergraduate, graduate students, um, to be exposed to, again, the Ivy League opportunity at Columbia, um, just to challenge me in different ways and, and really um, be intentional about management, um, you know, critical thinking around management strategy and critical thinking around finance and budget and stats. I, you know, I, I initially at the time went back thinking I was going to stay with the MBA and wanted to focus on, on economics and analytics and stats. I, I, you know, that was that was the wave in the MBA, right? Analytics is take, was taken over the MBA. You needed to have an understanding of the collective bargaining agreement and the way analytics fit into to, to, to basketball development and oversight. And so that was my goal, um, but it benefited me in so much more, way, many more ways beyond that. Um, and I was really thankful for that opportunity to be exposed to sort of comprehensive critical thinking and um, management training across a number of different areas. Yeah, I've, I've said this before on the podcast, but I think, um... You know, if people want to work in college athletics and, and ascend to those leadership roles, take advantage of either tuition benefits at your current institution or, you know, invest in yourself in a program that you find interesting because I was similar, you know, I, I, I wasn't positive I want to go back and get my master's degree, but it does help you um, because you're, you're being hired at institutions of higher education. A lot of time they are looking for that secondary degree, not saying everyone has to have one but it definitely can't hurt to, uh, to have that and show your commitment level to your own education. And so uh, thanks for talking about Columbia a little bit. And uh, so Chris Clooney, Director of Athletics, Davidson College, thanks for being on the Higher Ed Athletics Podcast. Yeah, thank you, Travis, for the opportunity.